Hi everybody, this is Keith Bergun, host of the Clockwork Game Design Podcast. Today I am doing something very different. I've been meaning to give this show like kind of a big overhaul for a while, um, and today's the day that I really do that. So the main way that that's going to change things is that the, the show's going to be a lot more structured going forward. Uh, mainly into three major sections. Um, so in every episode from now on, um, I'm going to have uh, a number of segments. Um, and the actual segments episode to episode may change. There may be some recurring kinds of segments. Um, I'm going to have more smaller interviews. Um, I also will still have the longer form interviews that I've had in the past as well. But um, I have um, some people who I'd love to have on to talk about a very specific thing, just to get into a conversation about a very specific topic. Um, people actually from the Discord often, who I think would be really good um, in these conversations. And so I'm going to have some of them on. Um, and. I don't know if anyone ever uh, listened to the Dino Farm Community podcast, but um, there was a while there, I think it was 2016, 2017, where um, several of the uh, Dino Farm slash Keith Bergun community members were sort of running their own podcast where they would talk about game design. And uh, that was a really cool podcast. I recommend looking that up if you are looking for more of this kind of dialogue. So I want to incorporate a little bit more of that onto my own show. And I also want to do a little bit more fun stuff that's still going to be game design related. For example, this week I will be talking about one feature that I really appreciate from a video game. That's right. That's something that people ask me often because I'm well known for my um, negative uh, critical opinions, but uh, less so for my positive ones. And I do have positive ones, and so at the end of the show I'll be talking about one of those. And also I'm going to be giving a paper prototype challenge that this is something that people at home can um, try on their own. This is something that I would do uh, in a game design class that I would run or that I have done in game design classes that I've taught uh, or sort of a variant of that. But it's the idea of like prototyping a uh, paper prototype really quickly with some um, prompts. And so I'm going to give you those at the end of the show. So anyway, the point is that there's going to be all this... Um, a lot of stuff going on in the episodes from now on. I also hope to improve the audio quality going forward, um, and I also uh, am trying to improve other elements of the production. So let me know what you think of this format, and um, if you like it, please let other people know. I think that the growth of this show has sort of leveled off somewhat in the last year or so, and I can see why. It had sort of the same kind of content throughout. Um, so I'm trying to expand that a little bit and um, hopefully expand the... Um, the reach of the show. Um, I'm still, it's still a, you know, it's a totally a game design focused show, but I just think that the show could generally be better. And so that's what I'm trying to do here. And let me know what you think. Uh, as always, if you do like the show, please consider becoming a supporter on Patreon because that's where the support for this show comes from. Entirely, I don't run ads on this show. So it's just, you know, I'm, I, another thing I'm going to be trying to do more and more is keep the show around an hour in length. I think a lot of people value it when a show is longer than 30 or 40 minutes. And some of my episodes are as short as 30 minutes. Usually they don't get that short, but um, I'm going to try to keep the show to an, at least an hour going forward. There's just going to be more content, and so it's going to make more sense to have it be a bit of a longer format. So let me know what you think. Um, support the show on Patreon. Get the word out about the show if you like it. Um, and yes, thank you so much for listening. And now on to our next section, which is theory stuff. All right, so we have two big topics today for the theory section of the show. Uh, the first one is this question about variable match lengths in strategy games. So, um, and I got this question, I think it was from uh, Hopenager, who is, um, you maybe have know from the Discord, uh, and I believe he was often on the com community podcast. So, um, he had this question about, like, why are variable match lengths important? Why, so in a game that has a win and loss condition, why is it important as I, I claim that it's important that um, that there's variable match lengths, so that you you know 
uh, to just say that the game ends after 10 minutes or to um, say that the game ends after 60 turns or five phases or whatever it is. I, I My claim is that that's usually a bad design call. In fact, I, I might even go further than that and say there's almost always something better that you could probably be doing there. And so I want to explain why that is. Um, it, it really has to do with, uh, if you read my article, Designing Strategy, um, which I'll link in the show notes, that's the one about the uh, econ rushdown defense triangle. So you're probably familiar with terms like rushdown defense and, and that sorts of things um, and what they mean in strategy games. And if you break down what those are and why those are important and why why those are kind of unavoidable in um, strategy strategy games, it it's because they the reason that they are sort of fundamental is that they really just represent different times at which there's a spike in quote unquote power. And I'm putting power in quotes there because I'm I'm using that in a little bit of a, of a prescriptive way. What I mean by power is not necessarily your current um, strength you know, or your wealth in the game or any literally any necessarily any specific resource that you have, but it's more like your, um, like the, 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 uh, the, the collective, uh, strength of your general position in the game at a certain point. Um, so let's, 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 let's get into what I mean by that with power. And so in, let's take Starcraft, um, the classic rush down zerg rush one way to express how a zerg zergling rush works is that there's a power spike that uh that the um the zerg player is able to produce early in the game that now you could you like imagine imagine there's a little chart of a little line everybody's power my play, power and your power the two the, the power of the two opponents um, are kind of going up more or less in sync sometimes one goes a little higher than the other and then it comes back together and maybe they loop back around and whatever and what happens when one player wins is that one of the um, uh, lines of power is too divergent from the other. And so that's an, that's a window when the player can win. And I think if you've played a lot of these kinds of games, like strategy games, RTSs, you'll go back and you'll watch, like you'll lose a game and you will um, take a look at the replay and you will try to find where was my window? Where was there a section that I could have won? And, and what you're actually looking for there is a section where your power curve was significantly higher than theirs. Now, this doesn't mean, uh, like, there's a way that this can be taken, which is to say that at every moment there is sort of a tactical battle happening and that, you know, if you just at one moment uh, have more power than another person, you just can just win. Whereas it's, it, you know, all of those um, factors that... Um, or not all of those factors, but some of those factors are tactical. Like that power curve is a summation of both your strategic value of your, like where your, where your units are and how much, you know, like wh how many expansions you have and whatever, all the things that you have, the buildings that you have and the tech upgrades that you've unlocked and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's also, yeah, where is literally where are each little Marine and every little uh, thing, detail and how, what areas of fog you've uncovered. Those are all factored into that little line. So I just, I just, you know, I just want to make sure that it's very clear that I'm talking about um, sort of the summation of the tactical and strategic power of a given player. So going back to the Zerg rush um, analogy, uh, the way that a Zerg rush works is that the Zerg faction has these Zergling units and they have the special quality that allows you to produce them pretty quickly and they move pretty fast and you can produce like just six of them. Back in the day, there was a six Ling rush. Um, I'm, I don't know if that's still a thing in Brood War. I'm pretty sure it's not a thing in StarCraft II, but um, that was the classic thing that um, when people talk about a Zerg rush or a Ling rush, that's what they're talking about was that original six uh, Zergling rush. And so there was a way that you could create a little power bump very, very early. And for a player who's not ready, they their power will be too low, too divergent, and they can just win right off the bat. 
Now, first, while I'm on this this metaphor or this example of um, StarCraft, I would like to say that I do think there's something really bad about that implementation. Uh, there's a lot that's wrong with how StarCraft deals with stuff like Rushdown. I also think that variable match lengths can be too di like too um, variable, meaning like you know, it's probably bad if your strategy game that averages a 30 to 60 minutes can also end in like three minutes. You know what I mean? Like there needs to be some, some probably some minimum and some maximum that, you know, maybe aren't too divergent from each other. Um, you know, a game like StarCraft, maybe it makes sense for it to range anywhere from 15 to 35 minutes or something like that, or 25 minutes. Um, just throwing those numbers out there sort of randomly. The idea of a super fast rushdown is probably toxic. Um, and that's kind of a, spe a special quality of rushdown because, um, you know, long arcs need to have time to form. And th th otherwise, it's like you're not even playing a strategy game. You're just you're just uh, and that is one of my complaints with Starcraft is that that is a little bit of a thing that can happen is. And, you know, I think uh, I'll leave my StarCraft criticism aside for now, but um, I just wanted to use that ex example of the Zerg rush as um, as showing the, the chart of, you know, one uh, power arc kind of diverging too much from the other and then a player being able to win. So that's an early power spike. That's what a rushdown is. Um, a mid-game power st uh, spike is usually like an econ win. And... Uh, that's, that's, that's the classic examples of that are making some early game investment, um, surviving, you know, rushdown strategies and then winning somewhere in the middle game. And then the only other alternative is winning towards the end. And that's like typically a, a defense, um, win is that you've, you basically are just, you're surviving the other players, um, stuff. You're out surviving the other player more or less. And that's what defense basically is. Okay, so that is the triangle. That's that's how the triangle works. Some people have challenged the idea of the triangle, and um, I I still maintain that the that it's really just uh, representing different spikes in power at what point in a match a spike occurs, and or or which point at which point um, does one player's power or strength or you know um, strategic strength or strategic viability uh diverge high enough above over the uh, above over the other players in order to win and and that's the other, that's the thing i was trying to get at before and i just thought of a good way to express it um how i was talking about how like oh, i don't want people to think that this is just this like moment to moment tactical comparison of the two arcs of the two like lines that are diverging from each other the thing is that these lines have momentum to them. You know what I mean? They're they're going a certain way. And the reason that investment makes sense is that you have a little dip now and you're like, OK, I think I can get away with this little dip now because you know that it's going to bounce back up and it's going to dramatically bounce back up. And that that bounce when it comes up, it may be enough to win you the game. So um, my point is that there is a structural, not deterministic is not the right word, but there is a, a structure and a flowingness and a momentum to this uh, this arc. So it's not as though it's all about comparing moment to moment, moment to moment. It's more um, I mean, there a, an individual moment will specifically trigger a win or loss. But that individual moment was sort of semi destined to happen based on how the arcs were going at, at previous points. Hopefully that's clear. I just wanted to get that aside. I think there are probably more challenges to the triangle thing. Um, I, I didn't set out originally to really defend that as much in this episode, but I'd be happy to have a conversation about that further. Let's assume if we assume that the triangle is um, is valid, is a valid way of looking at strategy games and in fact is um, sort of a fundamental in strategy games, then variable lengths is also uh, fundamental and valid and um, something that game designers should strive for. So th there's really short answer answers to this. Um, the, the, the simplest answer is to just look again at something like rushdown strategy. So let's say I, 
I effectively do kind of rush. I get that early game power spike and then uh, and I've basically won at that point. Like our lines diverge too much and then I've won. And now we still have like 60 percent of the game to go through. Like, so do you see the problem? There's a there's a problem there is that your players may not necessarily know it as they're playing, but there's a lame duck situation happening where one player has already won. They won maybe even a while ago and players are just still kind of going through the motions and those those that divergence will never, you know, have a chance to uh, recover properly. And so that's really the biggest issue. Um, you know, the the I mean, that also is an issue for econ wins. It also um, favors defense because we're we're all we're both guaranteed you and I to make it to the end of the game. Right. I'm not going to I'm not going to get like knocked out early or whatever. I mean, you, you kind of can uh, in the way that I just described, but. Uh, you're still going to be in the game. And it's sort of hard to know m during a game whether or not someone got knocked out by an early game rushdown. So that sort of leads players, at least psychologically, towards defensive strategies. Um, and and not only that, here's the worst thing about... Actually, it, that's not even accurate to say that it leads them toward uh, defensive strategies. It's more that it it... And you see this in a game like um, Dominion, even though Dominion doesn't, it doesn't really have, it does have variable match lengths, kind of. But what, I'm going to use Dominion as my example because I see it happen. Uh, I've played like thousands of matches of Dominion and you can see what, what, in that game, basically it's a deck building strategy game. And basically for the first half of the game, you're investing. And then the second half of the game, you're cashing out. You're spending all your money and you're buying uh, victory point cards, which are, make your deck worse. So they like slowing you down. Um, but you you know that the game end is coming. You know where the game end is coming. And and the problem, this is what's so bad about non-variable match lengths, is that when you know where the end is coming, that that are that tells the player where to invest and where to start cashing out. So, for example, it makes no sense at all if you know that on turn 100 the game is ending, you're not going to be investing on turn, you know, 90 or 85 even, probably even on turn 75. Um, you are probably going to be investing for more or less the first like half of the game because you know you're going to be around for this whole time. And uh, and then cashing out for the second half of the game. Now, I know that, that some people may say that Dominion is kind of a terrible example. It's not a great strategy game. And also, there's not a lot of ways that players can uh, actually interact with each other and um, sort of disrupt what each other are doing um, in the way that there is certainly in StarCraft. But even in um, other multiplayer strategy games, um, and that's true. Um, but but I think that um, there may be some counter examples to this um, where players are allowed to um, kind of interact with each other in a way that that mitigates some of this. But I, I don't think I've seen any examples of that. I'd love to hear some examples of that if anyone has one in mind. But um, in my view, that that lame duck situation, uh, the fact that players are sort of um, the structure of like if you so so if if you look at a game that has a variable match uh, uh, length, you can get all kinds of different arrangements. It just in terms of the strategy space, and this is the problem. I think the real problem here, and the reason that this is not connecting with everybody, is that I think people still have trouble thinking about a strategy game as opposed to a tactics game because, like. In some ways, all we have are tactics games. Like almost all the strategy games that we have are extremely tactical. Tactical tactics are allowed to override strategy just all the time, and um, that's very like normal. 
for us. Uh, I'm not saying that games don't have strategy. I'm saying that strategy can be overridden by tactics too often. And so uh, tactics is overvalued. And because of that, I think that we still are not really thinking about stuff like what I tried to describe with the with the arcs having this sort of deterministic flow to them. And if you do think about that in that way, variable lengths become so desirable because it's like you're going to have this dance of these two um, resource engines. And when you just have a set fixed ending to that dance, that determines other other things that doesn't just suddenly cut the game off and otherwise it's the same that determines the whole structure of the game and um, obviously you know I am pro structure in strategy games it's one of my things I always talk about but you know I you don't want um, to be restricting the strategy space and you don't want games to have kind of the same strategies over and over again and I think that non-variable match lengths are going to enforce that I think they're gonna sure it won't be as bad as Dominion I agree that's like not a great example for the reasons that one would bring up normally um, but I do think that that's also not a completely uh, absurd example um, other strategy games that I know of that which are better have the same that have uh, non variable match lengths have the same issue um, some of the Uwe Rosenberg Euro game uh, examples come to mind uh, as examples of games which I consider pretty good um, strategy games but which do have this fixed end, uh, end time like a timer sort of thing Agricola, Le Havre uh, come to mind as examples of uh, games that do that. I'm never sure how to pronounce Le Havre. I know there's like that little R thing on the end of it that's like, I'm not a, I don't know much French, but uh, uh, are you supposed to, is the American way to say it Le Havre? That, that feels wrong, but I feel weird saying it with the accent, so I don't know how to say it. But you know which game, The Port. Let's call it The Port. Um, that game also has, if I recall correctly, rounds, which is another example of um, of, the, of this issue. And you do find that there is like a building up and a cashing in phase. It just makes sense. In fact, these are sort of built into the game because you have things like these um, um, big hit point, you know, big victory point cards that um, you purchase. And uh, those are... Um, are, are really just for the end game cashing out and they don't even do anything in the game other than that. Um, actually, um, the port is a little bit better in that regard because um, in, in certain ways, because it the way that it does, does things like shipping is a little bit better. Um, there are some games that have like blurry in between -y sort of situations like Puerto Rico. Actually, Puerto Rico and um, Race for the Galaxy are both pretty good at um, allowing variable match lengths. And um, that's part of why I think they're really great games that allow for a very wide range of strategy. So anyway, I'd love to argue about this with anyone who is interested. Um, and that is concludes my section on variable match lengths and why they're important. I hope that I've... Um, said a few things that were useful. So before we conclude the theory section of the show, I did want to mention a um, user question. This is from uh, someone on the Discord, um, and their username is Bricks Parts or Brick Parts, rather. Um, and they have, they have the question, Keith, maybe you should have an article or podcast doing a deep dive on your view of complexity in games, especially with the common idea in-game design of elegance, minimum minimum complexity for maximum depth. It also sounds like you could go into detail um, about what you think makes good versus bad complexity. So complexity is a broad topic uh, in game design, um, and there's a lot. I mean, you could write several, I mean, several, several, many, many articles about the topic of complexity and various like subtopics. Uh, one thing that I can hit up pretty quickly is this question of the classic idea of elegance. One of the problems that I think um, people run into with elegance and thinking about and talking about elegance is um, confusing elegance with minimalism. This is something that I wrote um, an article about um, actually years ago. I'm not even totally sure that that article still holds up. I'd have to double check that. Um, but I will link it in the show notes. Um, 
So the basic idea here is um, we have this sort of classical idea of elegance. I don't know how classical it is. It's something that I've definitely talked about before um, as uh, defined by sort of you want the minimum inherent complexity for the maximum depth of the game or maximum emergent complexity. So what gets cited all the time as a good example of this is Go or even Tetris. Um, these are games that the rules of which you could describe rather quickly. Um, the complete rule set could be described pretty quickly and um, and then you get this crazy emergent complexity out of that. So I have like a I have actually a bunch of uh, complaints with that that way of looking at um, the issue. You know, one thing is like I actually do think that. Um, so so the first easy thing that I can say is that um, Tetris is is not um, complex enough. It, it is emergent in that, like, you know, it, it is amazing how much it sort of how much you get out of so few rules. But it's also a bit of a dancing bear situation where if it weren't for the gambling aspect of Tetris, I really think that it just wouldn't be interesting at all. Um, I just don't think it would be an interesting strategy game whatsoever without the sort of just hoping to get a line piece at the time that you want to get one. Um and I really think that's the whole engine of it. And so it functions the same way that ex even more simple games like um, classic uh, racing dice games um, work uh, or gambling games. Uh, frankly, uh, slot machines work in a similar way. Um, and so there is that one issue where there's some really simple systems that just really depend on variable randomness. That, again, being the kind of randomness that um, delivers like unequal amounts of power to players uh, based on RNG. So players are playing just really sort of hoping for good results rather than playing strategically. So that's that's one thing is that I think the, a lot of these games are just too simple. They're just inherently too simple. And then in the case of Go, it's interesting because it is too simple in that, and same with chess, there's not much you can do on a turn. Um, and actually there's like... I guess, you know, very veteran players would disagree with me on this, but I think that most players have the sense um, that there's not a lot that they can do in the game at all. Um, that, like, they really just have to look at the board, analyze, analyze the state, and just, like, don't screw up. Like, find a spot where you can place a stone or where you can move a piece where it won't get captured and you won't be screwing yourself over. And that's all you can do is place a stone or move a piece. There's not like, and yes, after several moves, like you, several moves of placing stones or moving pieces come together and create this unique sort of shape. But I mean, look at a game like, look at like, I don't know, Civilization or something or, or League of Legends or um, any modern games. And they all have that same thing of like, oh, I moved a piece over time and it created this weird shape. They all have that as like one one thousandth of their complexity, their inherent complexity. So like these games are, um, you know, are, are really not complex enough. They have very, very they have too few rules, uh, particularly Go. Chess is a little better. Shogi is even a little better. Um, if you haven't played Shogi, I recommend uh, game designers check out Shogi. Um, it's a little bit difficult to learn the kanji uh, pieces um, at first, but you get used to it pretty fast. And I think game video game players especially will really appreciate a lot of things about Shogi. But uh, that aside, um, so while they may be elegant in that um, people are playing them lots and lots and lots, yet you can describe the rules quickly. I really don't think that's like a good goal to shoot for. I really think that that version of elegance is is the wrong thing to shoot for. The fact that, you know, I, I, I guess the idea is, oh, it'll it'll spread really. It's like kind of like it'll become like a successful meme in that it's very easy to transmit. It's very easy to teach this game to someone. Therefore, it'll become popular. 
But I mean, look at, again, look at League of Legends and, uh, you know, Fortnite and um, all kinds of games that are not simple at all. And if anything, I see a trend of games becoming more complicated. Um, I mean, if you look at the entire rule set of Magic the Gathering, it's not simple at all. Um, you know, that's counting the cards and everything uh, as the complete rule set. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and, and some of my favorite designs are, are really just not simple. Um, so this idea, I really think we need to just, you know, if your idea of elegance sort of fetishizes uh, simplicity on the number of rules going in, I think it's the wrong equation. And um, it, it may be useful in... I think it is useful in teaching certain relationships, uh, teaching people what ele uh, sorry emergent complexity actually is, and this is um, so. So I think you should teach. You know, if you're teaching someone game design, you should talk about elegance in this way. Uh, at some point, you should talk about basically the relation. I think maybe a better term would be like um, emergence ratio or something like that, where we're just talking about um, how. You know, and it's fine to use the term elegance. I just don't like the term elegance because elegance sort of sounds like um, it's the thing to shoot for. And I don't think it's the thing to shoot for. And I will admit that this, I, I'm, I'm realizing, uh, probably contradicts some of the things in my, uh, in my latest book, my 2015 book, Clockwork Game Design. Um, and, but I also think that if you take the book as a whole, you probably still come to the same kind of conclusions that uh, that uh, or, or rather the way to put it is um, the as long as you understand that a game needs to be a certain amount complex in the first place, then this uh, elegance definition uh, doesn't hurt you too much. In fact, it might be fine. Uh, I just worry that between the how much we like, you know, uh, worship chess and go and how much we, um, you know, the word elegance, um, suggests minimalism. Um, and we worship things like Tetris. I just think that there's a whole packet of, um, ideas that will push us in the wrong direction. And we need to be aware of that. So that's, that's the first part on a discussion of complexity. The other thing that I want to say about complexity, what is good versus bad complexity? Um, so another thing about chess and go is that they do have a kind of inherent complexity uh, that I would call a bad kind of complexity and go maybe a lot more so than than chess. I mean, go one of the most ridiculous things about go is that it's a 19 by 19 board um, and like that's that's actually you know, if you take that into the video game world and think about like how what is the size of a grid in XCOM or in Civ, right? You know, hundreds of tiles. Uh, but the difference is that the relationships tile to tile, each tile in Civ just doesn't mean that much. Um, whereas one tile in Go can mean and often does mean uh, a complete collapse of a massive shape uh, that, you know, completely turns the tide of of the game. I mean, Go is a it is less of a tactics game than chess because of how big the board is. But it's still all these like very tactical relationships that are happening, these very short arc tactical relationships that are happening. And um, and yet it's huge. And so what I would say is that that's uh, that's bad complexity and that you're just taking this very simple relationship, this very simple, I surround you, you surround me or chess. Uh, we just have this, like my piece replaces your piece as the basic core mechanism, if you will. And we're just multiplying that out times a million in this turn, you know? So like the way that chess and go work is that they have a very, very simple thing that you can do, but, there's there's no information horizon at all so you can just like uh you know like multiply basically what you do is you multiply that sim that simple interaction by like a million and you're just sitting there looking at this incredibly complicated thing 
So it's it's not that chess and go are, you know, when you actually play them, there is a way in which they are not too simple, obviously. Um, but they are dumping this massive amount of complexity on you. And it's like, it's not really designed complexity, like it kind of is, but it's also kind of just this math problem. Um, and, you know, that's something that I think players tend to feel when they play these games, is that they just have to do a lot of sort of labor. And people fight me on this a lot, but, um, you know, my personal experience with chess has is, is been this way. I've heard uh, people of varying levels talk about chess this way. Uh, there's, you know, classically Bobby Fischer really hated chess. Um, I was going to play some clips from him because it's actually kind of funny hearing him talk about chess the way he talks about it. He's actually even more harsh on it in some ways than I am. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to play his uh, clips on here because he apparently was also um, kind of a raving anti-Semite, which is pretty uh, terrible. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to get too into chess specifically. The point is, what, what is good complexity look like to Keith Burgun? Uh, or what does clockwork game design uh, suggest uh, for good complexity? Well, I would say a pretty good amount of inherent complexity, like actually a, a pretty darn high amount of inherent complexity, um, maybe even higher than any of the games that we're playing right now is actually best for a strategy game. A strategy game might um, need to be, you know, I don't know, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think we're still exploring the or the like inner boundaries of this, but I do think that the um, games that we play and make right now are still too simple, um, even the more complex ones. Um, and there may be some examples that I'm not aware of where I would say, okay, yeah, that seems complex enough. But um, I think that what we want is very complex systems which give you very um, a small amount of information at any given time, uh, you know, so a very controlled, smart uh, information horizon. And then on top of that, um, a, you know, a complex system inherently is going to have a large amount of um, things that you can do. Um, so players should feel like the kind of complexity that should exist is the kind that makes players feel like a lot is possible and like that they can use creativity in making choices and in the way that they sort of express uh, their own um, uh, model of the universe, this game universe, through their moves. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my idea of good complexity, so other kinds of bad complexity, you know, like obviously I've talked about Magic the Gathering um, and those kind of things where the system itself is like five rules and then you just have a billion cards with a bunch of, you know, a big spreadsheet. Um, I think that that is bad complexity. Um, I do think that a game could have a pretty darn big spreadsheet as part of a larger its entire design, but you don't want to have, um, you don't want to have, first of all, you don't want to have such a hard line between what is, um, what is components and what is, uh, system, systemic rules. Like what are componential rules like cards in magic and what are systemic rules? Like, you know, you have 20 health. You want to have there be like things that are sort of in between. And I use those terms, componential complexity and systemic complexity, because they describe the games that exist now. But I think in the future, that line would be more blurred and uh, there wouldn't be. You certainly would have a good amount, like many systemic rules and also many componential rules and probably many of things in between. Um, so that's kind of. And that's that's what I want. And then I want um, also the area that I'm looking at right now when I'm about to make my turn to be very small and very simple and almost like look obvious in a way. Um, yeah, you know, I've talked uh, I had a tweet thread recently that kind of blew up um, wherein I, I talk, it was just like kind of a dumb thing. Uh, and I talked about, um, uh, it was one of those memes. It was like one like equals one, uh, uh, controversial gaming opinion. And I was like, well, I got to do this. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm more, con I have more, I feel like I have more con, uh, 
controversial gaming opinions than anyone inside games because you know most people who are inside games i think they like the existing games more than me and that's why they're still in games like most people who feel the way i feel about games and there's many of them there's many 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 people who uh, hate the existing games as much as i do they just aren't like in games culture at all um and for me i am for one reason which is you know I mean, for one thing, there are some games that I legitimately like a lot. Uh, but for the other reason, um, you know, I uh, I see a great potential in games. Anyways, I did this uh, controversial thing, controversial uh, opinions. And one of them, I talked about how games um, shouldn't require, or strategy games shouldn't require thinking. And this kind of uh, points back to the original question here about complexity and what is good complexity. Um, you know, because... Um, we should design things in such a way that that the the game is complex. It's very difficult to build a a uh, model, a perfect model of this system in your brain, so that every permutation that happens, you know, you automatically know what is the best thing to do. But I also think that um, games shouldn't require thinking, uh, which means I'm, I mean the word thinking a little bit prescript prescriptively because like so in a real time game, you know, like a real time strategy game, Starcraft or, or, or League of Legends, you are kind of always thinking, right? Like you're always like you're doing things, but you're also like sort of thinking, but you're never like sitting there calculating. You're never sitting there, you know, with your head like in your hand and just like churning analysis paralysis. Now, of course, this is you could say, oh, well, this is just a turn based to real time distinction. But I disagree. I think it's actually more. I mean, yes, if you make something real time, people can't just sit there and think. Usually it's also the case that it has a lot to do with information horizon. How much information are we giving the player? Um, and, you know, obviously there's other things you can do, too, like timers and stuff. But um I, I also wonder if maybe um, there's a way that we can like lean people towards a style of play. I mean, they did this actually a bit in Go. Um, in Go culture, you know, you're supposed to play somewhat quickly um, from some of the like the I, re I was getting really into Go and um, a few years ago, well, this is probably like eight or nine years ago now at this point. But they say that you should play Go rather quickly. And I think that's for similar reasons that, to what I'm talking about. So I'm just kind of wondering if like maybe there's a way that that we can kind of like nudge players to play quickly uh, i don't have a problem with a turn timer i think that's fine uh but for single player games i do think that most players are not really willing to accept that so you know and i would rather just build a game that doesn't really like invite sitting there thinking so um one way to do that's real time another way might be to decrease the information horizon just make it that there's not a lot to calculate it's more just like what do you think you should do you know? And that concludes our theory section for this episode. So now we've reached the design journal part of the show, and this is where I will talk about what am I working on, what are my design challenges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing I should say uh, is um, I did release a game just like a few days ago called Advanced Plants. And now this is a game that I worked on for one week with Happy Snake Games. Uh, we formed a little informal team called uh, Keith and Snake. And we're going to be making these small games, not quite that small, but we're working on another game that I've been designing for a while. Um, and I think uh, for one week, Advanced Plants came out really well, and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, it's a turn-based tactical XCOM style thing. It definitely needs another <laughs> at least a few weeks worth of uh, just iterating. Uh, this is pretty much the first like draft rule set. But for a one week draft sort of thing, it came out really well and I'm really happy with it. And I like some I like the theme a lot. It's fun and silly and it's about watering plants. Um, so that and that was a different process for me, too, in terms of game design. Um, I to just, you know, slam together something so quickly and in a collaborative way 
um, was new for me. I'm, I'm really trying to focus more on collaboration and, uh, and work with more people and, you know, different people. And, uh, I want to get more into game jams and things like that. So, um, advanced plants kind of was a game jam. It was like a one week long part-time game jam and, and it worked really well. Happy snake is great. It was a great experience. So I'm, I'm really happy I did that. I'm glad we got that out. And I do recommend checking that one out. I do think it's, um, it's pretty fun to play around with and there's some good jokes in it and stuff. So the other big thing that's been um, bouncing around in my head is 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 this question of what to do with Escape the Omnocrodom. And I wrote an article about this, uh, something called Moonshot Game Design. Uh, it's on my site, keithbergun.net. And so, you know, I Escape the Omnocrodom is... I have so many complicated feelings about it because so the state of it right now is it's um, it's it's not it's definitely not working right now. And but the the thing is, it's like it's not working on like a, a very fundamental level. And my latest theory for and this has been my theory for the last few months is that um, is that I've taken a what was a, what worked as a real time game, the MOBA genre lane pushing thing and I've sort of like just turned it real time in a way that you know I on some level I feel like I should have known wouldn't work exactly like I but but at the same time I'm not quite sure why it doesn't work um but I do feel it like while I'm playing I mean part of it it might be that like having these tiles and this huge map um it is um it's like you, you know, and people mentioned this to me early on that like, oh, I have to hit the move, 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 move top like button so many times. And I think that's part of it is that they, it feels sort of laborious to play, you know, because you have to like click, 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 click to keep moving. And I agree that that feels sort of laborious and and and, you know, the lane pushing mechanism, the minions pushing each other, that 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 maybe needs to be this a little bit messier process like this ball of like units just pushing into each other in the way that it is in all these MOBA games. And so, but at the same, so I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I've, I have a couple of hurdles. One is it's just going to be a decent amount of work. And I already feel like I put so much work into Omnocronom and Push the Lane and the three other versions of the game that came before it, um, which you can read about in that article. Um, and it's scary to think about putting more work into it. But at the same time, it's like, you know, a bunch of people bought this game, not nearly as many as I would have liked. Uh, but, you know, I do feel like I owe the people who bought the game something. And, you know, so it's really tough. I mean, this is one of the tougher things to work on as a designer. And maybe, I don't know, maybe this is the most important question of all is like, what projects are you going to work on? What are you even going to choose to do, especially when you're just like an indie working by yourself? Um you know, I I love this idea of having Omnocronom as my big game, my like, you know, my my baby, uh, which is something I've always wanted. I wanted Oro to be that. I wanted 100 Rogues to be that. And like every time technical, annoying, weird things got in the way and stopped that from happening. And this time I can do it all. Like I, I actually I own the code. I made the code myself. I, I'm you know, I'm I'm doing it. And at this and at the same time though now the game like this is this is my first like big investment game where you know the gameplay is just like not working and um you know it's that's that's tricky and tough and weird and you know i also I, what i talked about with the moonshot game design concept is this idea that you know a lot of people have the idea that like when you design games uh they should be fun right away like within the first I don't know, a few hours or at least the first week or two or first month even. It should be really fun. It really should be obvious. And like, I get how that happens for designers who aren't like me, who for designers who are making like, I don't know, a twin stick shooter or a classic roguelike or an RPG or, uh, you know, a sports game. Like, I get how when they're making their thing, they it's fun within a month or whatever and but that that's because it's a 
thing already. Like it's a, they're they're just cloning the thing that they're cloning more or less. I mean, of course they, you know, they may be. Um, th- my point is that they're working off an existing design, and I also think that it's it's more fun for them because it's easy for them to fill in the gaps for things that are missing right now. Like, you know, so if I were to start making a Counter-Strike based game, you know, and I just have this one weapon type and I don't know, there's a really simple level. It's easy to extrapolate out like, oh, what the rest of this will look like when we're done because we played Counter-Strike, you know, Um, whereas when you're making a weird thing for which there isn't really an analog and you're and you're doing all these weird things like it's not easy to extrapolate out. And so when I'm when I was working on Oro, I always had this vision of what it would be once it was done. And it was a loose vision, but I always had it. And then eventually it happened. But it took like years to get there. You know, for the first at least two years, it was not fun at all. And the vision wasn't coming together. And it was bad. And, you know, and uh, eventually it came together. And then sometimes I'm like, was that like a bad experience for me like do i am i like is this a bad takeaway that i should um you know uh, like because it's like really dangerous because i could just be working on some game for like 10 years like thinking oh it's going to become fun at some point i just have to keep working on it you know so that's that's a kind of a those are some of the thoughts that i'm having about i'm knocker dom i am definitely interested to hear if people have opinions on what what i should do with that because then the other thing is like you know it's it's really exciting to start new games it's really i have great ideas for things i want to work on um i have a lot of things in the back burner that I would love to bring up to a front burner. I'm starting a new game with Dino Farm and I'd love to put more resources into that. So it's not like this is the only thing I could work on. So I don't know, I'm mulling it over. I'm definitely not gonna start working on Omnocronom in the next few weeks because I have a bunch of other other things on my plate um, between now and then. But I hope that uh, sometime maybe in March, I can start uh, with the 2.0 Omnocronom update where I not only, you know, make the game real time and but I also, you know, solve some of the other problems with the game. Uh, There's some significant ones like the other lanes not working, like the item systems being uninteresting, like the character progression not being really a thing, Um, like there only being two characters. It's kind of weird. I'm going to I'm going to try to hit up all these things and and and. You know, we'll see how it goes. Um, I will keep you posted on that, of course, and I'd love to hear your opinion. So anyway, let's move on from Omnocronom. The other thing I've been working on uh, is Chess Piece, which is a uh, turn-based, score-based, chess-like kind of game. Uh, It's chess on a smaller grid with just a few units, and it's it's very light, and you just pick up these um, resources, use abilities... And, um, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm thinking of chess piece as more of a, um, I don't know, kind of like a light design exercise and, and game development exercise. It's not me pushing the boundaries of game design. Um, I, I have been wanting to make something that's a little bit more humanizing and a little bit more, uh, like less like toxic masculine attracting, and you know just like colorful and nice and you know but at the same time having some of those strategy levers there having some of the clockwork game design philosophy there um and so it's sort of like a meeting between like my the things that i care about more now uh which i guess you could say are our politics and the world and people and also the things that i you know traditionally care about good rule sets so i'm trying to marry those those two things and uh i think it's going pretty well um it's i I guess i'd say it's going very well uh but it's also just a lot of work and i'm so i'm just like really i really don't want to be working on games by myself anymore so (laughs) i i just i need to find more like collaborators because i i think with chess piece and with omnocronom I really have just been like, I don't know, especially with digital games, with with card games and tabletop games, those seem much more doable when you're just one person. Um, but, you know, just, man, programming is so much work. And so, like, 
between the programming and the game design. And by the way, it's like a toxic combination for me sometimes when I'm both the programmer and the game designer. Um, it's just like, it's so hard to just like sit back and be like, what would be good for this video game? And not think at all about how to implement, implement it. And like on, you kind of shouldn't not think about how to implement it because you got to implement it. So, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing. I've also, I've had an RPG in the back, back burner. It's like super on the back burner now. Uh, I'm thinking about while it's on the back burner, making a children's book out of the theme. I've been doing a few paintings here and there to uh, kind of like uh, just keep the, keep the idea of the world alive and, and sort of build it out and flesh it out a little bit. And I'm very excited by that. That would be so much fun to work on. That's one of these things that like, it's, it would be a ton of work, but like, I know it would work because it's like, it's a CRPG and I, I kind of like know what I would do and it wouldn't be like this game design shocker. It would be, you know, like, like humanizing Fallout 1, you know, with like bright colors, like Fallout 1 meets Steven Universe or something. Like, that's kind of what I want to make. You know, that would be so much fun to work on. It would be a lot of work. But I also feel it wouldn't be it wouldn't be stressful in the way that I'm not going to be stressful. So that's that's another thing that's going on in the back of my mind. I mentioned that we're doing Alaka Ram for Dino Farm. Stay tuned to the Dino Farm Patreon for more about that and the Dino Farm website. Uh, we're going to be writing articles and stuff over on that site. So definitely stay tuned over there. And then finally, actually, probably my my one of my most things I'm most feeling good about in terms of game design is I designed in the last year, I started about a year ago, I designed a paper card game, you know, like traditional tabletop card game. Uh, it's a traitor game along the lines of the resistance or Battlestar Galactica. In fact, I'm thinking of it as like kind of the two of those games, like, but blended and like, you know, Battlestar is this three hour massive like D&D simulation thing and the resistance is this five minute party game and I, I want something in between so the good news is like the thing I've been making is it's just been working like people have been having a blast people have been laughing and like having fun and it just feels so good to have something come together like that and so I really want I want to do one more play test the last play test went great I made just some really good improvements just now or like the last couple days and then I want to uh get that together get that out there let people play the game uh in fact I, I'm gonna very soon I'm gonna put out like a digital, you know, uh, print and play version. So that may even be out before this podcast. I'm not sure. We'll see how that goes. So that is the card game that I'm working on. And that's all the stuff I'm working on. So that's the update. I, that was a bit of a long one. Uh, hopefully there's some interesting stuff in there for you to chew on. Okay, we're almost done with this episode, uh, but before we're completely done, um, I wanted to do our fun stuff section. Uh, so the first sort of fun thing, I guess it's actually more of a, a theory thing, um, which is I wanted to highlight one good game design move in a game. Talk about one thing um, that a game designer did, which I appreciate in a game that people probably have played. So the example that comes to mind for me um, is actually Civ Six, and specifically the inclu uh, the inclusion of the or the creation, specifically the creation of the districts system. So if you're not familiar with that, if you've played Civ um, for a very long time, Civilization um, had these stacks of doom, which were like. You could produce a bunch of units and you could put as many units as you want on a single tile. And so by late game, you would get these like one tile that had like 30 or 40 units on it. Just a massive amount of power. And uh, it was kind of weird. It was like sort of game deforming. Even if they, they had, you know, stuff like unit upkeep and other... Um, features to try to mitigate the amount of uh, like sort of military power but like the problem is that like you have so much power concentrated in this tiny spot and it was just it was just awkward and weird and it never really worked that well and so for Civ 5 um, actually it was John Schaefer whose game just came out at the gates which people should go probably look into I have not yet been able to look into it myself um, but it's worth probably looking at 
Anyway, he uh, was behind Civ Five, which was the first game where they made <coughs> the... Uh, <coughs> it was the first game in the Civ series to only allow one unit per tile, which is, you know, really seemed revolutionary to me. Um, I was very excited for Civ Five, And, um, you know, I still, I, I enjoy Civ Five, um, And I think it sort of worked. Um, the problem was that the problem was that it sort of turned Civ into this gigantic tactics game. Uh, it, it had a lot of weird side effects that, um, like another way to put it is that like it's it sort of Civ isn't a war game, but by having this one unit per tile thing, it sort of made Civ um, kind of operate on the playing field of a war game when it's really just, it's not a war game, um, and it's not a tactics game, and so it created it created other problems. Um, but I did appreciate it. But it's just like, it, it's kind of like, the game is fundamentally this spreadsheet. The Stacks of Doom kind of made more sense in, in Civ 4. Um, Civ 5 was like, it just wasn't going far enough. Now Civ 6 comes along, and they basically do a similar thing for cities that Civ 5 did for units, which is the district system. And this is the move, the design move that I wanted to talk about. Um, I really appreciated districts in Civ 6. Basically what districts are, are now your cities, by the way, are stacks of, of buildings. They are basically stacks of doom of buildings. So every single building you build, and with, over a course of a game, you probably build like, I don't know, 50, 100 uh, buildings in a city. And uh, maybe not 100, but, you know, a large number of um, buildings inside that city. So if that city is raised, it's just completely, uh, all everything is destroyed in one shot. And it's a little bit weird in that same kind of game deforming sort of way. So what districts do is you now build nearby your city a science district, a commercial district, a um, there are various kinds of residential di districts. An aqueduct takes up a whole tile. Wonders take up their their whole a whole tile on their own. And so what that does is it brings the city building aspect into that tactical world that um, was created in Civ V um, and thereby makes the whole game a little bit more cohesive. So like, I don't think districts really did for Civ what needs to be done for Civ. Um, like, I don't think it really brings it into this holistically coherent strategy game space, but I do think that it was a great move. It was a, a great move in the right direction. Uh, and it definitely, in my opinion, makes Civ VI um, on this fundamental level better than Civ V. Of course, it, when Civ VI came out, it was a little bit... It had a lot of problems, had a lot of AI problems. I mean, all the Civ games when they first come out have problems. So Civ V is a little more developed right now. Um, Civ VI did just come out with an expansion a few months ago. I don't know, six months ago now at this point. Um, and it had... Um, some good stuff and one really bad feature, which was this Golden Ages feature, which was just just terrible um, in a lot of ways. Um, so I've been playing um, once when I do play Civ, um, I play with uh, the 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 entire expansion off. You can't just turn off the uh, Dark Ages, unfortunately. And they're making another expansion, and who knows that maybe that'll be good. Um, but uh, the point is that the districts is a is is a good move because. You know, it's if you have a big grid, you always want to try to use that grid and make sure that you don't just have all the tiles mean almost nothing until they mean suddenly everything. And that's kind of the problem with those stacks of doom and the, and the problems with the cities of doom. And so District stretches that out a little bit. I still think there's some other thing that they can do that goes even further. One of the things that like my game design spider senses are like tingle at is there's this idea of like adjacency bonuses. Um, so every um, district, like if you build a building, you know, there's a lot of games like tile-based strategy games that have this thing with adjacency and it, I, I, I feel like it never ever works and it's never anything but just dumb because like, oh, I can put, I can put this building here and I get plus three science or I can put it here and I get plus one science. I wonder where I'm going to put it. So, um, you know, I, I think that that kind of 
and at the same time, like, I think it's coming from a good place because adjacency is using the grid. Um, but it's 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 just always used in this extremely tactical, like, it's all, all it cares about are the tiles that are right around it way. And so I think that there's some more advanced version of adjacency that's more like, um, you know, how how many how many tiles are you away from is this tile away from the next commercial district or like near a river and how how much uh like commerce does that river touch things like that might be a good um way to think going forward just what you want is more tendrils of meaning stretching around uh and less uh less of these barren wastelands of meaning uh with these sudden gigantic pillars of meaning so, um, yeah, I think anyway, districts is my smart game design move for today. And, uh, yeah, uh, let me know what you think. Um, I know people have a large amount of opinions on Civ, um, and I have many more opinions on Civ, but I will save them for now. And now on to the fun stuff, the final fun thing, which is, and I don't know if this is going to be fun to listen to, but we'll find out. Um... I wanted to do a on the fly paper prototype challenge. And this is something I've done before in game design classes that I've taught. Um, usually it's for kids, but I feel like adults would have fun with it too, especially if it was part of like a social thing. So here is your paper prototype challenge. Okay, so I have, I'm, I'm linking this in the show notes uh, that I, I'm, I'm, I have a Google Doc that has a bunch of mechanics. Uh, and the, it's a list of mechanics from Board Game Geek's uh, list of board game mechanics. Because again, this is a paper prototype. So um, we're going to randomly generate one of those. We're going to random randomly generate a number that corresponds with one of those. And then we're going to also randomly generate um, three nouns. And you have to use those nouns as part of your design. Um, so they could be part of, you know, the the theme of the game. They could inspire a mechanism. Um, there could be actual verbs or cards that are named after these things. Whatever comes to mind, but you have to use all three of them. You And you have to use the mechanism that is listed, uh, that, that is given. So I'm going to give you the challenge now. You ready? Here it comes. And also a really cool thing that we can do is, and probably nobody will do this, but just in case on the off chance anyone wants to, and it'll be easier for me to find what y'all are doing. If you use the hashtag CGD podcast, podcast, that's Clockwork Game Design Podcast, uh, but just the letters CGD podcast. Um, if you tweet it, tweet your idea, uh, your little game design document, whether it's like a text file or a paste bin or a Google doc or whatever it is, um, uh, and I'd love to take a look and then we can all share and see what we're doing. Uh, so let's see how it works. So this week's paper prototype challenge, let's generate the, I'm generating the, uh, random nouns right now. Okay. So for the random mechanism that you have to use, um, you have to use action slash movement programming which uh, BoardGameGeek.com explains as uh, every player must secretly choose and commit their moves for the next N turn. So for a few more turns, you have to like, um, you have to basically program out your next few moves on a character. Uh, I think the most famous example of this is Robo Rally, um, which most people have played. Um, And uh, yeah, so that's what you have to use action slash movement programming as the mechanism. And the random nouns are edge, permit and walnut so i'll say those again edge permit and walnut all right so now you have to design a game using those um and this is probably dumb but if you do end up doing it you tell me about it use the uh, cgd podcast uh hashtag and uh, i'd love to hear about it so thank you anyway thank you for listening to today's show that wraps it up um, as always, I really could use your, pre- uh, your support on Patreon. And by the way, I have a huge announcement about Patreon. Since you listened through this silly game, now you get to hear the cool announcement. My patrons are now going to get access to, like, I think all of the games that I work on, um, for free. I'm, I'm really getting tired of the whole trying to sell your games thing. It doesn't work that well for me. Um, Patreon has worked much more well, uh, much more betterly and, uh, and, uh, it, it just, it, it aligns my interests with, uh, like 
my interests as a game developer with your interests as a player. Um, like Escape the Omnacronom, I want to keep working on that. Um, and but I, I feel like and I feel like maybe a lot of you do, too. But, uh, you know, actually, it's more in my best interest as a person who just sells premium games to just make the next game instead. And I don't I don't like that. I would rather I mean, I, you know, Patreon, something like that gives me the flexibility to work on a new thing or to continue um, working on I'm not gonna like whatever is the best call. That's what I want to do. And I think that's what you guys want me to do, too. So um, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Keith Bergun. It would mean a lot to me and it would really help. So thank you so much for listening to today's show. I uh, let, let me know what you think of the new Uh, format and everything and i will see you again pretty soon with interviews next time with uh uh a few a couple of people probably anyway thank you so much for listening and i'll see you next time